Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is day five of a special week's worth of shows in honor of Black History Month, and I've had a fabulous co-host all week, Dr. Columbus Batiste, and I'm sad that this week is ending because he has to go out of town, but I've already begged him for next year, can we do the whole month, even if we have to pre-record some of these, so so I'm hoping he says yes. So we have a Another fabulous guest today, and I will have him introduce her. Please welcome back the co-host with the most, Dr. Columbus Batiste. Oh, hello, hello. Thank you again for having me. You know, AJ, this has been an incredible week um, with you. It's too too short, just like February is too short. Black History Month is way too short, and Heart Health Month is too short. And, you know, Koya, one of the things as we, before I introduce you, is that I, I like to say at the start of every show, just because of the fact that someone may be tuning in because they're just specifically looking to listen to you and did and missed our other guests. And so AJ is a phenomenal woman, you know? And so I, I like to kind of give homage to her a little bit because when I first started on this journey of really transformation in terms of my approach towards life and wellness and so forth. I met this young lady and she embraced me with arms wide open and has been nothing but encouraging throughout and on a consistent basis, putting me in, in front of the right individuals. And so I'm honored to be in front of you today. I'm not sure if I uh, had a little video drop out here, but we'll keep going once Koi is able to kind of reconnect with us momentarily. But uh, AJ, it's been a fun week. It's been it a really fun is. week. It's so <laughs> fun working with you. Are you kidding? You you have such just you're so skilled. No, 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 no. I've, I've watched you for quite some time, quite some time. So I'm taking some pointers. But Koya, how are you today? I am absolutely wonderful and grateful to be alive. It's such a privilege to, to live. We know a lot of people who have been through so much turmoil, trauma, and a lot of people who have transitioned. So I am just grateful to be alive. Hey, man, you're absolutely right. It's been, it's been, I won't even say a year long. It's probably been a good three years of just upheaval, stress, uh, loss, tremendous loss of, of routine, loss of connectivity, and really loss of years of life is what we've observed during this time. And I know right now, I mean, there's no other better way to wrap up this week than with you and all that you've done inside the world in terms of trying to bring healing. And, and you know, so for those of you who don't know, Koya is a, she's a highly sought after holistic health and wellness coach, motivational speaker, uh, revolutionizing the holistic living landscape. And, and you know, I'll be honest, I did, for those of you, I, yeah, I'm a little bit older, so I did, a, I did a Cliff Notes version of trying to dig into Koya a little bit here. And I'll tell you, I was nothing but impressed, impressed, impressed throughout the times that I've had to review information on you and just your passion, your desire to help individuals, your why. And so there's so much I want to touch on today because there's so much that resonates with me, believe it or not, even as a cardiologist practicing and what my, my mantra is, I, I, I think that there's so much. So thank you for what you do and welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. That was such a warm welcome. And, you know, just with what you said, like, I believe in the duality of life. So I believe even though we're going through a lot of transition and turmoil and stress and things like that, we're also going through a lot of connection, um, raise awareness, more people vegan than we've ever had. And, you know, and so there's so many, a lot of collaborations and connections happening. So I really embrace the darkness and the light and encourage people to do so, so they can get to through this time and really focus on how they can continue to let their light shine, even though they're experiencing darkness. You know, um, before we dive into it, you know, I want to ask you one simple question. This is going to probably be the easiest question that I talked to you about today. <laughs> Who is the greatest track athlete of all time? Oh my and goodness. You can, and you cannot list yourself. The greatest track athlete of all time. Well, I adore Jackie Joyner Kersey. Ooh, so yeah. I was a heptathlete. And, you know, I, I love Jackie Joyner Kersey. She is who inspired me to be a heptathlete um, because, you know, you have your, your sprinters and you have your, you know, every athlete is an amazing athlete. But I say Jackie Joyner Kersey because 
she's personal to me. And I feel like, you know, um, mostly event athletes uh, and being holistic kind of go hand in hand, running, jumping, throwing. And so I just think she was a phenomenal athlete. She lived a phenomenal life and not many people talk about her, you know, but she was a great athlete and she, you know, just a great person all around. So Jackie Joyner Kirstie is my favorite. Love it. I remember her. I remember growing up watching her and everything. So that was good times. Well, so of all of all the uh, the activities that you participate, the events, which one was your strongest? What were you best at? I love the high jump. Like okay. <laughs> the high jump was my favorite because it was so hard, but I love, I love jumping. And when I started, I was jumping on, we didn't have good facilities. I'm country girl from Tennessee. And we, all we had was a mattress and a septic tank pole. I remember the first time I jumped, I landed on my back and I had a big whelp on my back. And I said, I will never do that again. So I started scissoring the pole and not jumping with my back because I didn't want to hurt myself. Well, that built up my stamina. And then when I was finally taught the Fallsbury flop to go over my back, my hops were so good that I went to the state meet my sophomore year and it continued to elevate me um, in my events and put me among the best and ending up 13th in the nation out of college because of that one first flop <laughs> on the pole <laughs> and me saying, I'm going to jump as high as possible and then arch over this bar. And so high jump is my favorite. Oh, that's, that's great. I mean, and I mean, I think those beginnings probably are reflective of everything else in life and that you've kind of spoken about because that one traumatic event, because I'm sure it didn't feel good <laughs> <laughs> when you fell on that pole, that that was the foundation because of that, that really led to your excellence in performing that skill. And who would have thought that out of this trauma, out of this pain would arise this, this opportunity for you. So that, that's, that's, that's very cool. That's very cool. So when's the last time you've done any running, sprinting, jumping, uh, anything of that sort? Oh my goodness. Well, in, in track and field terms, a while, but as far <laughs> as running, I actually run a mile a day and okay. or walk a mile a day. And it's something that I keep up and I try to time my mile just to keep keep that, you know, once an athlete, always an athlete. So just to see where I am fitness wise, I'll time a mile like once a week. Um, and I try to just do that just to stay, stay healthy. But when it comes to like lacing up cleats on the track, oh my goodness, it, it, it's been probably at least six years. Um, and even then I was doing it just for like um, commercial type of work or some photo shoots or things like that. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I, I, I can't necessarily say I can relate to the whole athlete thing. It's I, I, <laughs> I, I, I ascribe to the old adage, the older you get, the better you work. <laughs> oh. So, so listen to me, tell it now I was like a baller. I was, you know, I could have been an NBA, NFL, a sprinter, <laughs> but uh, not quite, not quite. I'm probably where I needed to be uh, right now at this moment. So uh, no, very good. Very good. You know, so, Tell me about like the transition towards how, how did you, I mean, you grew up in Tennessee. So I went to school in Alabama. So the South, mm -hmm. I understand the South and the South is prime real estate for cardiologists in terms of like eating, <laughs> in terms of heart disease. How did Tennessee, how did a Southern girl begin to find her way into eating healthfully, especially an athlete Southern girl as well? Right, exactly. As an athlete, you're like, Psh, I can eat whatever I want to eat. And I remember feeling just that. Uh, when I started college, not only did I gain the freshman 15, I gained the freshman 25 and enjoyed it. I enjoyed my extra thickness because I wasn't a Cali girl. In the South, you want to fit, you want to put the weight on. You know, everyone had always been telling me when I was younger, I was such uh, olive oil, very slender. And so I ate everything that I could. But with that added, weight, my numbers went down in the high jump. I didn't understand why I couldn't get over the bar, even though I was lifting and it was, it was healthy weight. Um, it was too much scientifically, you know, <laughs> yeah, science, right. it don't work like that. <laughs> That's right. Gravity. Yeah. Gravity doesn't work like that. So, um, I really had to learn to eat smart and that it wasn't just about calories in calories out, like what I eat, it mattered. And food has different nutrients. Food has different vibrations, depending on where it was made, if it's an animal or not and different things. So I really had to learn. And I think I started learning in high school, just about nutrition. Um, and, you know, I was like eating all my courses and following the food guy pyramid, which I love because it had a ton of bread. I was like, good, yes. I can eat pasta <laughs> and crackers. And I loved it. But then when I started getting in college, it was like, okay, 
Um, you can't eat whatever you want because I had a lot of mucus and I was always mm-hmm. coughing up loogies on the track and that wasn't cute. So I went in college. The first thing that I cut out was pork. I was dating a guy who was Muslim and um, yeah, I cut out per- pork first. And then, you know, different things came along like salmonella poison with the chicken, tryptophan with the turkey. So I honestly just kept cutting things out. And then eventually I was just eating fish and eggs and I was working at this vegetarian restaurant called Rancho's in San Diego. One of my clients, Marcus Moet, was the owner of this vegetarian restaurant. And I started making this food. I started reading things like the mucusless diet. I started reading things like rainbow green life foods cuisine. I was like, wow, look at all these things that you can make and you don't need eggs, butter, things like that. And then I uh, read Things They Don't Want You to Know About uh, by Kevin Trudeau. And I was like, okay, there is poison in the food. So I really did, I did the um, master cleanse, cleanse my body. And I was just eating clean since then. But I didn't go 100% vegan until I saw this track athlete. His name was Obia Moore and he was fit. Because I'm going to be honest, back in the day when I started, almost all of the vegans I saw were missing teeth or the teeth were out. They didn't have much weight on them. And I'm like, I'm not going back to look like that (laughs) because I've been there already. So I was like, not the teeth, but you know, I I was happy with my track week. So I thought I needed protein, you know, the Mm. question that all people ask, which I have a lot of respect for that question. I know a lot of plant-based people or vegan people, they get annoyed with that question, but I have a lot of respect because I remember I was worried about the same thing when I started because of what we were told we need meat, we need butter and dairy and all these things for strong bones and strong teeth and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, if I see this guy, he's been vegan for four years and he looks like a fitness trophy. I think I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna do it. And so the more that I ate plant-based and I also had all these books and I can make all these recipes, the better I felt, the better I looked, I had more energy. So I was like, this is amazing. And my whole thing is like, as long as I can feel good and it tastes good, I'm going to do it. And then when I started seeing documentaries that told me how animals were abused and how detrimental the whole animal agriculture uh, climate was, I was like, I don't want no hand in that. And then when I learned about the environment and how much water and resources we can save by eating plant-based, that made it like, 100 percent i'm vegan for the rest of my life and it's been 16 years and i'm still vegan and loving that more people are going vegan because now i got way more restaurants to eat at <laughs> <laughs> tell me about it. there's some good ones out there mm-hmm. so i mean so so being from the south how did the family deal with all that when you would go back and forth and they're laying out like the sunday <laughs> dinner or the the thanksgiving or whatever it may be christmas whatever time it was I remember they're like, so you're not eating food, but can you still make it? Because I was a Southern girl. I love to cook. I remember my dad would give pay me to make steaks because I seasoned it the night before and I'd sit there and let it cook thoroughly on each side. And I I just really knew how to cook and knew how to bring, bring out flavor. So I was like, no. And I love making bacon and breakfast was my favorite meal of the day. So people wake up to the aroma in the house and they were like, but, but what about breakfast? What about steak? <laughs> and I was like, I can make other things that you love. So I made what is called life force lasagna. I make them smoothies. I make them apple pie, like things that I know that they would like vegan that, you know, I wouldn't make them fake meats because that would just annoy the heck out of them. Yeah. So I would just make the things that, that they'd like. And well, I mean, and to be quite honest, I was a little military at the beginning. I, I want to be honest about that because I once I found out all these chemicals and toxins like, you know, MSG and, mm-hmm. you know, artificial flavors and coloring and, and, you know, all these things, I went home and I threw away all the snack cakes and Twinkies and honey bun and juices that said 100% juice, but they're only 5% juice. On. I did all that. And my parents were like, if you don't get that food out the trash, you didn't pay for that. <laughs> and so they completely went off on me and I had to learn to like, calm down my approach. Mm-hmm. And so when yes. I calm down my approach, I just start feeding them the good foods. I start going shopping for them and buying enough to share with them. And that's really what helped my, my sister is hundred percent vegan. My nice. um, brother is about 90% and my family eats a lot healthier because I learned how to just share instead yes. of kind of force my perspective on them. 
I love that. I love that. And that's been the theme for a lot of folks that we've spoken with this week who are in the black and African American community. It's there's an issue of respect and you can't come at folks any kind of way. <laughs> They're that's not going right. to have it even if you try. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so you have to come at them in the way in which, OK, try this and begin to kind of let them the tastes and flavors, which is always a fear. Am I going to lose my taste and the flavor? Mm -hmm. Now, now you say you're from Tennessee. You describe that you can cook and throw down, but you don't have an accent. What's going on? You don't even, I don't even hear an accent coming out of you. Thank you. If, if I talk enough, you'll hear it. And especially if I'm in the South, it comes out. I'm like a, a chameleon. So I yeah. speak like people I'm around. If I'm around someone Jamaican, I'll start speaking Jamaican, Southern, <laughs> start speaking Southern. And I love accents. So part yeah. of my in, I'm an empath. So part of my connections, I just start picking up language, even if I don't want to, sometimes it happens just, just in a way to connect. But I definitely have a couple words like hair and different things that I say that are very Southern that people tease me about. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. No, my <laughs> wife is, my wife is from Georgia. And mm -hmm. as soon as she lands in the airport, all of a sudden, what sounds like a Cali girl, all of a sudden is she's down home and <laughs> she starts right. with the accent. And I'm like, where did this come from? Who are you, you know, in this moment? Exactly. It's like, y'all come on in here. Let's get some food. And yeah, we're going to do that. And you start talking slow and drawing out your words. But it's, it's not like some of the TV shows that really make it even more yeah, <laughs> unbearable. Absolutely. It definitely they, happens to me. They definitely. It, it, you're right. You're right. Now, so, so in your coaching, you're coaching folks. And so I imagine you coach a fair amount of, of women of color. Um, too, as well, as far as amongst everyone, right? Because that's what your goal is to treat, is to impact the world. But when you're approaching, do you find that it requires a different approach when you're in, in communities of color or individuals of color in terms of your approach with them? Do you ever find yourself, I think connectivity and relationships and understanding culture and the background is extremely important. You know, so whether or not for myself, as we I dig into this question, if I'm if I'm addressing a, a, a person of Filipino descent and I start talking to them about their cuisine, I start throwing out some terms that they realize that, OK, he knows a little something about me. Or if it's someone of, of Hispanic origin, I start throwing out a few words and say a few words to kind of just break the ice. And then I start talking about the food. You know, we dig in and we start digging. And they're like, oh, OK, or a cooking class, same sort of a thing. So how what's your experience been? And in, in, because you're big, obviously you're a licensed coach. And um, what's your approach with that, with different ethnic groups? Mm, my approach is love, you know, yes. and my approach is, uh, you know, just treating everybody with the utmost respect, respect and understanding that we all have a bit of unconscious bias. And so trying my best to make sure that I understand the trauma that lies within each culture so that I can not have that unconscious bias, especially in mixed group. That's where things can be very volatile and know that, you know, as a black woman, we're not going to always be the first person to raise our hand, but we still, we need to sometimes be asked where other people might be like, oh, I got this and I know this. And, and knowing that if other people of color are not that like, I got this and I know this still to reach out and say, what do you think? What's your opinion? Because I think as women of color, we're used to being asked last, not being asked along. Maybe our thoughts and opinion don't matter. So knowing what people's traumas are can help you have compassion and not be like, well, you never raise your hand or you never speak out or, you know, expecting them to be a certain way of a other of another culture because you understand the trauma that they've been through and that they need to know like let me know my voice matters let me know that you want to hear from me because all how I've been treated in past in the past my voice doesn't matter and it doesn't matter so I'm just going to sit here and say nothing that is something especially um, with people who want to be allies, they have to understand that by marginalized, uh, about marginalized communities and people that you have to reach out to them and you have to ask because, and it's, and if they don't ask or pipe up, I mean, a lot of people are like, well, they didn't ask or th they didn't want it. And it's like, you have to have a little bit extra compassion and you have to reach out be because of trauma. A lot of people who have been oppressed or marginalized are not comfortable reaching out because it hurts to hear no, it hurts to be left out 
it hurts to say something and not be listened to or not be validated. And that happens time and time again. And our yoga teacher training, we're the number one yoga teacher training for women of color. And we have a diverse group. We have people in our membership from all around the world, all different types of nationalities. And so having that perspective is really important. And, you know, not only for, you know, Black women specifically, um, which I have, you know, <laughs> the experience being a Black woman, but other marginalized groups and women in general, you know, because we do have men that come through the program as well. And just really being, being um, aware of unconscious bias and also encouraging my community to take unconscious bias training. So they are also aware, like, okay, even though you want to say something every time, give other people <laughs> the space. Yes to speak and to answer. So that's kind of how I handle it in my community. I love that. I love I, I love that because that was going to be one of my questions in terms of, you know, what your role is and, and how you see yourself in this interplay of being a leader, a thought leader, an action leader in the community and still being uniquely who you are as a black woman and how you express that. And really, you know, if nothing else, 2019, 2020, 2021 has taught us is that the divide in the country is still there. And like you said, there needs love in order to heal it or empathy that needs to, needs is, is needed in order to heal it. And, you know, I think there's been great work that's been done as I listened to you by the likes of David Williams out of Harvard and many other researchers who pointed out the issues of microaggressions mm -hmm. or, or this everyday discrimination, right? Does someone give you a look? Does someone somehow think you're less intelligent? Does someone how, somehow think that you're less accomplished, that you're, uh, that you're more inclined towards theft? And all these things begin to slowly erode at your well-being and who you are, these micro traumas, right, that, that, that are occurring mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Um, so it's, it's powerful what you're doing in terms of healing. And as I looked at your trauma, I mean, as the book, and, and, and I just got the book and was going through it feverishly and so forth, and I loved it. And we'll get into that a bit more. I think there's such a connection. There's such a connection that all of us can can uh, relate to inside of that. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. I believe when we're able to be vulnerable and share our traumas, which I wasn't always able to do. I was like, I want this to go away. I want to pretend like it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. If I close my eyes and put my head in the ground, <laughs> it's not real, but that's not true. And once I started to look at like my challenges as here to help me grow and evolve, like they're not here to defeat me um, and anything that I go through, I can grow through. I start being more comfortable with sharing sharing the things that that happened to me, the thing, the traumas that I experienced. And especially when I realized like me sharing my trauma can help inspire others. Like you are not what happened to you. You are not your trauma. You are not your, your childhood. All of that stuff is a part of what you maybe overcame or a part of what you experiences, but you don't have to identify with that. And I think that's empowering. And I think a lot of people who are, have been oppressed, who do experience microaggressions, you're not that microaggression. You're not how people treat you. And that's something that I still experience to this day, even going through all the things and people going through all the trainings, you know, I, I still experience it. And it's something that, you know, cause someone asked me the other day, do you always speak to it if someone is offensive to you. And, and I was like, I'm going to be honest. No, because it's exhausting. And I have to decide if I want to speak to it or if I want to breathe through it, if I want to have create a healthy boundary so I don't have to address it, but it's up to me to decide how I want to handle it. But it, it it's always happening. It's still happening. Um, and sometimes, you know, when I hear it towards me or someone else, I just take a breath. And I send that person some love because a lot of times people don't even know. And I just say, you know, I, I try to tell people like it's, if it's someone that I work with, someone in, within my community, I might email them or reach out to them and say, hey, you know, um, that that was said could be hurtful to, to some people or that was hurtful for me. Um, this is how it made me feel. And so more than anything, I try to communicate. But I'll sometimes, um, you know, I don't. You know, and sometimes I might communicate and the feedback I get back is like even more aggressive and even mm -hmm. more 
um, harmful. So I've learned to just be with myself. I've learned to get loved up and love myself and realize that at the end of the day, I'm responsible for learning, my, uh, loving myself and getting myself to a healthy place. That's why I created my community, Get Loved Up, is because we have to be responsible for pouring into ourselves, even though we live into a world um, that could be harmful to us. And we are all, all human beings are living in a world where there's some harm and there are some, some good things, right? And so we have to choose to vibrate at the frequency of those higher vibrations, not the lower ones. And being oppressed, you have more and more, you know, lower vibrations around you all the time. So how are you going to get to this higher vibration? And so what I teach people is like going into the breath, practicing yoga, meditation, journal, all these things can raise your vibration no matter where you're at. And the breath is free. It's a free tool that we all can use. A lot of people have a lot, but they're still not happy. So it's not about money. It's not about how much you have. It's not about what you own. It's about your happiness. It's about your peace of mind. And so I've learned that in dealing with all of that type of stuff, it's really about your peace of mind. It's really about you knowing that you have a choice. You don't have to do or not do anything. And then giving people and empowering people to take their well-being into their own hands. Love it. Love it. Love it. You know, as I listen to you, I mean, that's why there's so much synergy in life. And I believe in what you're saying wholeheartedly. And for the word trauma, for me, the synonym for trauma that I speak to is stress and stressors. Mm -hmm. And as you speak to the fact that there's so many traumas that everyone exists, that uh, experiences, and they may be micro, they may be macro traumas that they go through and that you have certain oppressed groups who have more. That's why I characterize as stressors, right? Mm -hmm. That these stressors everyone has. And then there's a ne another layer to the stressors that people of, of color and of gen various genders and of uh, orientation may experience a discriminatory stress that right. then amplifies on top of it. And what the studies have shown as a physician, I bring everything back a little bit to science, is the fact that they lead to disease. There's yeah. a direct association between chronic perceived stress and disease. There's a direct correlation between discriminatory stress and chronic disease that elevates the disparities that exist and the, the issues. And so our health is uniquely tied to, I say, resiliency divided by, um, by, by stressors, the higher your stress, the poorer your health, but we could substitute stress with trauma. The higher your traumas that are unmatched, the poorer mm -hmm. your health. And so unless you're building that resiliency, right? That resiliency that's going to come through multiple facets, it's going to come through your how you perceive the world mm -hmm. and deciding, is this something that I am going to take in and hold on to, or am I going to release it differently, right? What is the way in which I'm going to interpret and process this in order to kind of move forward? How is my resiliency through my activity, my breathing? And the other powerful thing before I, 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 I want to get your thoughts on it and more is the breathing, right? What, what the breathing is so powerful that we don't do, we don't breathe well. And breathing is so essential to our being. And the thing is that it activates our parasympathetic tone, all right? And so mm -hmm. this parasympathetic, parasympathetic tone, this calming effect that happens, it's, it's the opposite to the stress. Right. Sympathetic hormone, the sympathetic cascade that's there. So it can help to lower our heart rates. It can help to dilate our vessels and it can help to strengthen our well being. And so there's so much power in all the things that you've said that I, I read that resonates with me and that I, I speak about on a regular basis. I love it. I love it. Mm, thank you so much. And I know as a cardiologist, it's like, how can we, pre how can we help people with their heart? You know, because like you said, the breath is is so important. And I truly believe, especially when it comes to the nervous system, the more we can help people, you know, practice breath work, the more that we can lower the heart rate and help them regulate um, from a scientific perspective. And also the breath can be healing to release some of those traumas that you mentioned as well, some of those microaggressions that are within the body. And I like to talk about the spiritual energy center as well, because I feel like, you know, we have the mental, the spiritual, the physical, the emotional, all these different um, parts of wellness. So as a holistic health coach, I let people know, look, the breath is free. We have it when this we enter this world and we don't need it when we leave. 
So I know a lot of things, yoga mats, yoga clothes, you know, a lot of this equipment can cost a lot of money. And I think accessibility is important when we talk about oppressed groups. So I like to teach people breath work because it's something that's absolutely free that can help you lower your stress. It can help trigger your parasympathetic nervous system so that you can rest digest and recover. And the more that we can get people practicing that breath work, the more we can help them heal through the traumas that they experience. And I think that is just so important. So, so, but also using the sympathetic, you know, the breath is also there to like, you know, get us revved up and ready for the day instead of that coffee, instead of that caffeine that's going to stress us and strain our adrenals, we can do the breath of fire, you know, and just really ignite our body. And, and it's absolutely free. So I absolutely agree with you that it's scientifically proven that, you know, natural things can help improve our health. And it's really needed if we want to heal as a community. Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. You know, it's, it's, I, I hate the fact that we have to still talk about a lot of these things in terms of oppressed groups um, in this day and age. And, and as I get older, I think someone was asking if I was as forthright and discussing many topics like I, you know, when I was younger, the answer is absolutely not. And what I love about today's generation of individuals is the fact that they're doing it at a much younger age mm -hmm. and the fact and that it's important. And we're seeing how all this played out. And so I'll tell you, when I see people who are sick that I know, I feel, to be honest with you, I feel a little, resp I feel a little responsible, like I could have done more to help them. Mm -hmm. And I get a little sad as I reflect mm -hmm. in the community and things like that. And when I see the images the stressful images that like we experienced in 2020, 2020 and others and, and, and the, 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 the atrocities that occurred, it also struck me that, that I have to be more, say more, be more available and have a presence that's there. Tell me about, about with yourself and, and how you were impacted by the things that have unfolded over the past several years now. I feel like I've always seen the trauma, you know, I'm growing in the South, the South is black and white. <laughs> you know, one yes, thing yes. I love about California is just way more diversity. I truly believe the more diverse, the more we heal, the more we start understanding different cultures, not just rape, but race, but cultures. I think when you just boil it down to race, it can become even more divisive. But when you start really understanding a person's cultures and a person's pain and things like that, things we, we really take a moment to understand, you know, the world isn't just black and white. The world is beautiful. And there's so many different cultures. There's so many different um, types of people that we can re just respect their heritage and respect how they were born and what they like and, and respect it as beautiful. And I think that's, that's really important when it comes to really connecting on a deeper level and really embracing um, diversity. Uh, and for me, I feel like the more that I think about the last two years, for me, it was a time for me to go inward and do a lot of research myself and see how me being complicit and not talking about some of my own pain and trauma was part of the problem and how I could use my voice more and share about my own trauma instead of just stuffing it away and pretending like it wasn't happening. So even though I'm resilient, I still need to say, yeah, someone said this to me and it hurt. You know, I was crying. Like, you know, I felt like everyone else got invited out, but they didn't invite me um, because they didn't want to deal with my blackness <laughs> and having to what, make sure that they didn't say anything that was offensive. Um, you know, so things like that and, uh, and just admitting that, you know, oh yeah, I know that they hired me not because of my expertise, because they didn't even ask me anything, but just for my blackness, just as a token, you know, and, um, and also turning down jobs like that to where I didn't feel valued. I didn't feel respected. So it's been, um, uh, a couple years of a lot of introspection and also reading a lot of books and understanding the history of oppression and the history of, you know, what has happened to us over time. And I initially was like, you, I was like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about white supremacy. I don't want to say that word. I don't think anyone's supreme. But when you look at the system, 
systems of oppression that govern the world and our government and our prison systems and all like that, you got to talk about it. And talking about it is the only way we can start to heal it. And so, um, you know, revealing is healing. And so the more that you talk about it, so the more that I talk about it personally, the more that I talk about it when it comes to like the government and our, um, our, our prison systems and our food systems, like all the systems, the more that we can have those nurturing conversations that we need so we can do something about it. So I realized that there is power and discussion, um, duality, like, uh, like if I'm going to talk about the light and how great things are, then I should also be able to talk about the darkness and realize that if someone's hurting anywhere, someone I'm hurting and someone's hurting everywhere. So like you said, when you see someone and you know them, you're sad. Now, if I see someone and I don't know them, I'm still sad because I'm connected to that person, right? So realizing our oneness and how like we're all connected, right? And if I don't feel something, just ask myself like, how have I separated myself from this person? And how can I reconnect? And so it's been a, it's been a very beautiful journey for me to self-reflect and, and decide how I want to show up in the world. And can I show up in the world more authentically um, to my pain? And if I can, knowing that that's going to help other people going through pain. And I feel like that's true for all of us, no matter what, who you are, what color you are, we all have experienced pain. And if we're willing to dive into that pain and understand everyone's experience of pain, it'll help us empathize more, even if that pain is different from ours. And I think all of us having to go through this time together gives us more empathy um, for, for oppressed groups. And so, yeah, that's how I feel about the last two years. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. I, it's, 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 it's a heavy burden. It's a heavy, it's a, it's a heavy weight. And and I, res I resonate with what you said because it's like, end of the day, it's empathy, it's love and quit being selfish, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I, I, although I speak about selfish in a positive sense a lot of times, but, but selfish, here's the thing, like, you know, for me, when I'm in a clinic and there's been times that I always, my, the worst version of myself, because it's not always all smile, you know, jokes and giggles, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so the worst version of myself, I'm busy when I'm focusing on what I have to do, when I'm focusing on where I need to be, if I'm focusing on what I have to prepare in terms of presentations or, or budgets or whatever it is, and I'm going into a room, I'm not giving respect to that person who's sitting across from me, who's here to be healed, who's here to be heard, who's here to find out how they can be a better version of themselves than what they were before. Mm -hmm. And so I think that investment of who we are in our time and individuals, which is really kind of what I'm hearing from you is so important. It's so important in terms of our ability to connect, to truly connect with, with others and so forth. So that, that's, that is powerful and it's not easy all the time, right? It's, right. Not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not easy if, if we're being honest, it's not always easy. No, it's not easy, but it's worth it, you know, yes. and if we're if we're willing to do the work, we're going to see the benefit every single time. And, you know, sometimes that work is painful, just like working out in the gym when we're running, when we're, you know, lifting weights, when we're working out in any type of way, there is some pain in it. But at the end of the day, we get stronger, you know, and we become more resilient, like you said, and that's why we see the resilience in a lot of oppressed cultures is because we've had to deal with so much. And that's why when we start to heal those cultures, we're going to grow as a, as a nation because that healing is going to help every single person in the world. That empathy um, and that strengthening of the most oppressed of us is going to help us collectively heal. So I really believe in, you know, in oneness and how that can really change what we're all experiencing. Because some people might think, oh, well, because I'm privileged, I'm not experiencing that. But you are. You are, you just don't see it, you know? That's why there's so much depression and suicide, no matter how much a person is like, oh, they were a millionaire. Why'd they just commit suicide? Well, they weren't happy. They didn't have peace of mind because money isn't everything. And so you see the turmoil of a lack of connection hitting all of us, that stress hitting all of us. So I always tell people that sometimes we are unaware of the silent, the silent 
things, but the more we talk about it and bring them to life, the more we realize, the more that we're able to share and communicate, the more we're able to heal. So I, I think that's that's the biggest learn lesson I've learned. And I feel like I'm, I'm going to always shout it from the mountaintop because I feel like it helps people who are suffering in silence. There, there, there are so many. I mean, we obviously have unfortunate examples of that just this past week and, and everything else. And really it's every day. It's just sometimes it's brought in the news that we'll hear about it. And it's, it's so sad and it's so unfortunate, the fact that the lack of training, but I'm gonna touch on before we move out this heavy portion of our conversation, you know, and, and I think there is so much when you talked about reading and learning and, and history and trying to dig back into the various aspects and to learn, whether it's the food systems and how, you know, there's there's this misappropriation of, of foods and, and, and these illegal or these harmful substances that are allowed into our foods or these hybrid foods where there's a question of whether or not they're disease forming or not and, and so forth. And all these things that are ingested or the, in, the infusion of these fake foods, these artificial foods, these Franken foods and in communities of, of color and in all urban communities across the United States um, that are there, you when you start to dig beneath it, it can become stressful because you're like, man, this is a big engine of just selfish intent that's after money making. Right. Uh, you know, it's like for profit and for power. It's right. like I'm going to manipulate food, individuals, communities for profit and for power. And and so it, it, it can be and you wonder the approach. That's why the approach from all of us on different angles is so vitally important um, in terms of constantly bringing attention, awareness and raising a voice of dissent. And then we have to ultimately vote with our dollars, right? Yeah. That's the only way, you know, because back, back in the day, I know Chef AJ knows this. She's been, she's been vegan vegetarian for a long time. They didn't have all this stuff. There right. wasn't like all these different products. I mean, I walk in any grocery store, there's a whole, you got owls and shelves and everything else de dedicated towards vegan products, whether or not they're all healthy or not, <laughs> but the business of business is business. Mm -hmm. so at the end of the day, people are going to get into business if they feel it's going to make money. Absolutely. And you spoke to it, um, but I'm going to give people a quotable to write down. Um, education stops man manipulation. Mm. Education stops manipulation. So the more that we can Hashtag educate that. people with this live, with this, you know, and, you know, they are like marketing, the social dilemma, like all these things they are marketing and they are after our dollar. So the more that we educate people on what they should use those dollars for um, and how it can impact their health, you know, the better. Because the thing is, I mean, the fact that they have a lot of, you know, I guess, fake or vegan foods, I'm just happy that it's making people realize, and I hope people are picking this up, that vegan is the way to go and people are aware of it. So now, oh, let's scramble to see what we can make. But you have to notice when, okay, when I look at the ingredients, these ingredients aren't healthy and these ingredients are artificial. So that's when we have to take the power back into our own hand. We have to read the ingredient labels. We have to look at this thing, but at least we know that people are, are, are voting with their dollars and they're saying, hey, I don't want to eat animals. So that's stopping that production of animal products. And now it's like, okay, I don't want like this highly processed food. You know, is this high vibrational? Is this good for me? So at one point, I feel like there's good, better, and best. Like there's levels to this. And I'm glad a lot of companies are even making vegan products because I, I think it's helping people jump on the vegan wagon to say, oh, okay, I have something to eat. And I think the more that we educate people as they're in the plant-based vegan realm, the more they'll start to pick higher vibration vegan, vegan foods. And I'm a vegan foodie, so I'm just going to be fully transparent. 80% of my diet is super healthy. And then that other, no, 90% of my diet is super healthy. And at 10%, I'll eat anything as long as it's vegan. So I need to say that all the Franken foods, all the hot dogs, all the cheeses and stuff like that. Now, if I eat too much of it, even been vegan for 16 years, I'm going to have mucus build up, I'll get pimples and acne, um, I'll get tired, right? So, you know, even though you taste something, you can't have that in your everyday diet and thrive. It's, that doesn't work like that. And so I like to be very honest about that in my Ooh. personal um, diet. When I wake up, I, eat, I drink 32 ounces of water, 32 ounce green juice, 32 ounce smoothie, pretty much every day on the weekend, I have 
French toast and waffles and pancakes, uh, but I'm not doing that every day. So I think it's all about balance and harmony. Also, it's all about seeing how the world is changing as we change, as we start demanding more vegan plant-based foods, they come, as we start demanding fresher foods, they come, as we stop buying things in plastic, they start, they start doing more glass and recyclable things. So we are the force behind what we see in the world. And as soon as we're willing to take responsibility and start educating ourselves and educating our families and communities, we're going to see a change like we're seeing now. And that change is going to continue. Absolutely. I'm gonna give you another, another quotable. It's not even mine, but without knowledge, the people will perish, right? And yeah. so you, just, you just, you just broke it down. <laughs> and so from an environmental standpoint, from an animal uh, standpoint, and from our health and purpose standpoint, yeah. it's, it's so, so, so important. And transparency is, is real, right? I mean, because mm -hmm. why I respect you for that transparency and I acknowledge it is because people want to see real people, right? None of us are perfect. There's right. going to be a little slip up here and there. And so you have certain standards of what's allowable for a slip up. My slip up is super like, that's not a slip up, man, but it depends. <laughs> it's all relative. <laughs> Right. Everything in life is relative, right? It's relative to where you're at in, in terms of perspective and so forth. So, but, you know, speaking in terms of like that social dilemma and that pressure to kind of chase the carrot, that golden ring that's out there. I mean, you're doing phenomenally. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're doing wonderful, wonderfully and so forth out there. How do you balance the pressures of success to keep being successful at a young age, right? I mean, right. you're not at an age that you're like, okay, well, I'm gonna retire in like a year and a half, or maybe you are, maybe you've blown up like that. And I don't know, but I mean, you know, so it's like, <laughs> well, what's, what's, you know, there's like, what's, what's next? What's next? The next, this, the next, that, the next, the other, how do you channel those pressures that are from within and from without external and internal? Well, you know, consumerism is real, you know, and I'm definitely a part of it. You know, if, if, if we're honest and, for me, I have to make a commitment to only promote the best products. I've loved products since I was a little girl. I would get consumer report. What's the best vacuum? What's the best car? Like, I just love finding the best of the best and sharing it with you. I love when veg juice comes out. Okay, this is the best vegan cheese. This is the best vegan. Like, I love that. So I have to be true to who I am. And then I also have to realize that if someone's going to choose this lifestyle, I want them to know they can come to me and I'm not going to lie about what tastes good and what doesn't. Right. Mm -hmm. And so whether it be a restaurant, whether it be like a product you're buying at home, whether it be the efficiency of a vitamin or supplement, I'm trying to taste all of them and find the best of the best. So when people do decide to go high vibration, they have a good experience and they don't get caught up on the fake stuff. It doesn't taste good, but just going with the packaging of being vegan, you know? Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. kind of where I stand in it, you know, but I also will admit I'm part of, you know, I'm part of consumers. Like I, I promote over 40 different um, brands, you know? Yeah, I didn't even know that. Okay. Yeah, I do. That's I do. And I love it. <laughs> you know? That's cool. I, love, I love doing it. And I think there's a place for it. Yeah. I feel like there's a place for everything, but we have to decide what, what do we stand for? I could be a model for McDonald's or Burger King, or like, uh, there's a lot of, you know, over 500 brands that will reach out to me within a year. I chose 40. So I think, honestly, I need to talk more about that. I don't, I just do what I do, <laughs> but I think I need to talk more about all of the ones I'm turning down, you know? And I think that's, that's really important. And I think that a lot of people want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I know that's not the, the greatest term, but what I mean by that is that we don't want to see any promotions, but it's like, how are you going to know what's good? And then you complain like, this isn't good. Well, like we need someone vetting those things, right? And so I think it's like a, a very nuanced and I think it's a balance when it comes to, we need to communicate about the best of the best. We need to communicate with companies like, hey, if you wanna jump in the vegan game, please make the product pure as possible. Don't just throw whatever. So I think it's just a part of communicating and knowing where you want to be in the game. And so I'm the kind of person who would say, hey, no, I can't promote that. I need you to take this ingredient out and this ingredient out because 
aspartame gives me headaches. Okay. Ethanol doesn't work with my brain, you know? So, and they don't know these things. They're like, oh, well, it's plant-based. So we put it, you know? So I think that there is room for people like me who have, who has the nutrition education, who has the um, knowledge of these chemicals to help companies make better decisions about the products they're creating for people to consume. So yeah, I think it's a beautiful thing to, um, but it's also very nuanced, you know, because well, I have to no. say, I, I love that. And that's, yeah. the, that, I love that aspect in. And so, but what I actually meant was more so like, I know you're a multi-skilled individual, right? So you have mm-hmm. like multiple talents. So I use the analogy of, of my wife pushing me and saying, there's no period behind doctor. Yeah. Right? There's, a, there's a comma, there's a comma, right? So it doesn't mean that you have to stop there. You can still be a great dad. You can still be a great, you can mm-hmm. be an author. You can be an interviewer. You can be all these things. And there's no reason for you to put a period. And that's what I, I've gathered from you in your life. In that midst, in the, the mix of me trying to achieve all those things that come behind the comma, right. that can create a lot of self-generated stress. There can be a lot right. of external pressure to- I see. Can't you, you know, you should be doing more. Right. right? And so when I, when I, so what I meant with coming, cause I, first of all, I am never opposed to making money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not, listen, it's not the driver for me at mm-hmm. all, to be honest with you. But that's, once again, it's easy for me to say, because I've been very blessed and privileged not to have to be in the situation where mm-hmm. I'm struggling to make ends meet. And if I'm going to have enough money to pay the rent. At the end right. of the day. So I, I live in a unique situation that may not be the majority of people in the United States. Mm-hmm. But what I mean is, is in terms of this, this internal fire and drive to do more and balancing that out with all the other aspects of our well-being and wellness, you know, and our right. mental health and sanctity. Yeah, that's a good question because I am a multi-passionate person. I love doing what I, I like to do, everything that brings me joy, right? And that's how I find what works for me. But there also is, as an entrepreneur, um, a process um, given to me by one of my mentors, Marie Forleo, and it's simplify to amplify. So the more that you can simplify your life into like maybe the top 10 things that bring you joy, the top five things you bring you joy, and then maybe even down to the top three, and spend most of your time amplifying those things and spending your time and day in those things. And then making sure your day, like when I wake up in the morning, I have two hours of spiritual time. That's meditation, yoga, breath work, going outside in nature, maybe going to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I pour into myself before I start doing those seven things that I absolutely love. So I think you really do have to prioritize self-care if you want to maintain your health, if you're a multi-passionate person like myself and like you, you really have to, I tell people it's 50, 50, you got to pour into yourself as much as you want to pour into the world as it's going to be an imbalance. It can't be, well, I mostly do all this work and I, sometimes I get a nap. Sometimes I take care of myself. You're going to burn out every single time. So um, I simplify to amplify when it comes to my business stuff. And I've had to learn to tone all that passion down into the the best things and start doing the best things in a better way and then other things i'm passionate about just maybe help other people collaborate more and use my desire and passion for those things to support other people so that's what i'm doing as i mature realizing i don't have to do everything it is not my job to save the world it is my job to do the best that i can in regards to the things i love so i have the morning time and then at noon i have alert in my phone how do you feel and what do you need And sometimes it's a glass of water. Sometimes it's time in nature, but I check in with myself like midday and I put that in my phone. And then at the end of the day, I only work from 11 to five. Let me tell you, uh, probably eight years ago, I was working at 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So I cut down on my work time. And then at five o'clock, I'm talking to friends, family. I'm going out to dinner. You know, it's just like I'm having a time to where I can just stop working and really pour into myself, pour into my community. Because a lot of people say it's lonely as an entrepreneur. And it's like, because you're not making any time for your family and friends. You don't have to forget about your family to be successful. You don't have to have no friends. And I think for a long time, I was hearing that. Like, you know, I heard so much that it's lonely at the top and you might have to do this all by yourself. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just go with that. But then I realized as I start, you know, surrounding myself with people who are healthier, to be honest. And they're like, yeah, I got to make time for, you know, my family and kids and friends and and things and so when I start doing that I 
became more successful. So it's not true that you have to spend, you gotta be in hustle culture and you have to get four hours of sleep. I did that for many years, four hours of sleep. That's all I need. I'm happy go lucky. And although that's true, I can get by with four hours of sleep. Um, I try to get six to eight because I know giving myself and my body more time to rest, recover, renew. And even if I'm not sleeping for six or eight hours, I'm doing the meditation, the yoga, the journaling, I'm having restfulness and that's helping me generate. So when I do get on a call like this, when I do speak, I bring energy, I bring vitality, I'm not tired. So my philosophy has been just pouring into myself at least 50% and then pouring into the world the other 50%. And then I will always have a lot to give. AJ, she's not real. Is she? She's <laughs> not she's real. Not. I mean, I is she a clone? Right. I mean, I, I don't know. I have to figure out if she's if she's real or Memorex because that's, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed. And it's been, it's an honor. But I, I have to ask you, as we get wrap things up here, I have to ask you one question. What's your favorite restaurant? And well, I guess that would mean that you're, you might offend some people, but I think I'm gonna ask anyway, what's your favorite restaurant? vegan restaurant in los angeles or in the mm -hmm. world uh, why don't we make it why don't we make it outside of los angeles since you live in los angeles and you probably have to see those people that you kind of don't don't uh admit this to oh man yeah that's hard <laughs> <laughs> i would i could tell you in los angeles. i like talking about my favorite food um in different restaurants to be honest but let me see. My favorite restaurant outside of Los Angeles would be. Why that's a hard one. Mm. Oh my goodness. Ah, let's see. Nashville. Oh. Florida. I just came back from there. Ooh. Okay. So there was this one restaurant that I went to and I said, if I had a restaurant, it would be just like this. And that's Christopher's Kitchen in um, West Palm Beach. It is so delicious. It's so good. The ambiance is so nice. I met Christopher when he was actually a chef out here in LA and I didn't even know it was his restaurant and I ate the food and I had this experience and I looked around and had all the different uh, types of food and all the desserts and all the things. And I, I fell in love with it. And because I had that experience, I'd have to say that would be the, the best restaurant. And I've eaten at a lot of amazing restaurants, but it's a very, very awesome restaurant. That was Christopher's what now? If I remember in West Palm Beach. Christopher's, Christopher's Kitchen. Kitchen. I'm Enjoy jotting that down. Yeah. West Palm it. Beach. Here I come, West yeah. Palm Beach. Enjoy <laughs> it. <laughs> Man, Koya, it's been an incredible opportunity to, to uh, meet you. And I love your spirit. I love your honesty. I love your energy. I love your passion. I love your message. And um, it's no surprise to me that you've achieved the success that you, you've achieved. And so much, many blessings to you. Continue on doing what you're doing. You are a, a bright light and example uh, to the world, and especially inside of our community. If we had more people like you, I, I know we'd be making even better strides than we're starting to do right now. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for all that you do. You are so kind. Thank you so much. It's great to meet you and speak Likewise. with you. And I appreciate the time and space. Yes, yes, yes. AJ? Well, thank you. And Dr. Batiste, I also appreciate you coming on this week and helping me with these wonderful interviews. And I hope you will come back soon. And Koya, of course, you're welcome to come back as well. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And Take thanks care. all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time when my guest is Dr. Stefan Esser. We're going to be talking about fingers, feet, and forks, the three Fs. Take care, everyone. <laughs>